hearts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. I wonder if that's what it's like in the temple. Come on, begin to say, I enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter your courts with praise. I lift up a thankful heart and bless your name. Come on, lift it up. I enter your gates with thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus. I enter your courts with praise. I lift up a thankful heart and bless your name. We bless your name. We bless your name. So, so good. Now, why don't we go across the aisles and let's be thankful for that we've got brothers and sisters in Christ, that we've got new people that we can meet. We're so happy you're here this morning. We're so glad. We bless your name.
You're still worthy. Jesus, you're still worthy of it all. You're still worthy.
present God of my future You write my story You hold it all together God of my present God of my future You write my story song of thanksgiving thank you thank you thank you father thank you father thank you thank you thank you you're so faithful father thank you thank you thank you father you're so faithful lord thank you thank you thank you
Thank you. Lift up your song to the only one who's worthy. To the only one who's worthy. We say thank you, Lord.
sing and my soul sing my soul sing how I love you my soul sing my soul sing my soul sing It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Yeah. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all. fix our eyes on you and we say we love you Lord come on just fix your eyes on him lost in his majesty Lost in his majesty, isn't he captivating? We fix our eyes on you, Jesus.
Oh.
From you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You deserve. He is worthy of it all. Oh, he's so good, and he's so worthy of it all. but sing, God, you're so worthy. You're so worthy. You're so worthy of it all. And this morning, we just exalt you. And we lift your name up high. Oh, because he is the only one that is worthy of all honor, of all praise. The only one worthy of exaltation. He is holy and he is God, even when things didn't look good. Santo tú eres, Padre. Santo tú eres. Eres digno de toda gloria, de toda alabanza. Eres digno de toda gloria, de toda alabanza. Y esta mañana te exaltamos. Y nada más cantamos, gloria, gloria, gloria a tu nombre. Uh, gloria, gloria, gloria Es el nombre que es sobre todo nombre And we just say Holy, holy, holy Is he The only one who is Worthy of being told Holy, holy, holy Are you Santo tú eres Santo es el que vive Y santo es el que viene Holy is the one who lives, and holy is the one who is yet to come. Santo, Santo, Santo. We serve a God that is a living God. We serve a God that hears us when we cry out. And this morning while we were in worship, I just kept seeing this image of a little child trying to learn how to ride a bike, but they were doing it on their own because they didn't have a father there to hold the end of the bike and guide them along and to teach them how. In the middle of that, I could see the heartbreak of this child who's saying, I don't have my parent to teach me and I have to figure it out on my own and there's no one cheering me on. But he figures it out. But not realizing that the entire time there was the one true father cheering him on. That the entire time the heavenly father, the good father was there holding and saying, you can do it. 
I believe in you. You got this. You got this. And that's been the entire life is God saying, I got you. You're not alone. I'm standing here. I'm cheering you on. I'm supporting you. I'm teaching. I'm guiding. Even when it hasn't looked the way you thought it would look like. Maybe it hasn't been in the form of an earthly father. But let me tell you something. Your heavenly father was always there. Your heavenly father was always there to clean up tears. Heal the broken heart. Guide you. Put people in your life at just the right time to help you turn and make a smarter choice. I know he's done it in my own life where he strategically placed people in my life and said, nope, that's not the direction I want you to go. Because that is what a good father does. And we serve a good, good father. But this morning, um, Megan actually got a word and it says, God is healing hearts this morning. Age old wounds. Wholeness is coming this day, this hour. And I just want to encourage you that if that is for you, just lift your hands up. Treat, let it all go. Because we serve a good God who is ready, who is able, and who is saying, give me your mess. Give me your broken heart. I will give you a renewed heart. I will heal the brokenness. Who says, I call you to wholeness. I am restoring everything. So, Father, this morning, I just say thank you for complete restoration. Thank you for wholeness, Father. And we just take a hold of what it is that you're saying that this is our hour of wholeness. And that this is our time of complete healing. Father, where you are going to come in and you're going to trade in our ashes for your beauty. So, Father, thank you. Thank you that you are restoring, you are healing, and you are renewing our minds and our hearts. With that, Miss Marie, if you'll please come. Wow. God is so amazing. Well, I'm going to do the announcements this morning, but I first want to have an announcement because it's Father's Day. And I just wanted to give you a little thing. Um, whew. Okay. Um, I've been without an earthly father for since I was 12. And um, I... I've had a heavenly father since I was about a teenager. Um, and just like Soshi was saying, that word was for me, that he was always there. But not till this, this Father's Day holds a, a completely different meaning for me uh, because I was healed back in the beginning of the year. And the things that I was healed of allowed me to let go of the orphan spirit. So. So. This Father's Day, I celebrate my father. Because I really, I've always had a heavenly father, but now I made the commitment that I have that heavenly father. So, all that being said, in my family, um, I've always been the one to uh, encourage the children. Don't forget, it's your dad's birthday. Don't forget, it's Father's Day. You know, I've always been the one to remind, you know. So this morning when I was in prayer and I said, Happy Father's Day, Father. I said, what, what would you like today? <laughs> and he just said, you. I can do that. I can do that. It's very inexpensive. I can do it. So, 
Anyway, then he, he is so good that he said, encourage my children to give me a gift too. And I just encourage you, you know, how you would go to your earthly father and spend time with him and tell him, you know, and even buy him a card and tell him how much you love him. I just encourage you sometime today that just get before the Father. And, and there's probably been many of you that have already done this. But get, get before the Father and just say, God, happy Father's Day. I just love you. Thank you for this. Thank you that you help me in this. Thank you that you're, you're always there, that you never leave me or forsake me, that you love me, you know. And um, just give him some time today to appreciate him because he's our father. He's our ultimate father, and he loves you. He showed me, too, about, um, you know, we don't have to be jealous of, of, of our other siblings, because he showed me that when you come up to him onto his lap, his lap just gets bigger and bigger. It's, it's as big as whoever wants to come to him. <laughs> so I encourage you, don't forget your daddy today. Okay. So all that being said, we got a lot going on. Oh, um, in June. Oh gosh. <laughs> June twenty fifth. Oh, we're gonna have a little activation. This is gonna be fun. Okay, I'm gonna say the announcements, and then we're gonna go back over them, and I'll go. Oh, on June twenty fifth, what are we having? Okay. So remember, listen to what I'm saying, right? All right, we have a special guest on June 25th, Evan and Madeline Threckelin. Um, hey, sweetie. I couldn't even tell that they were mine. <laughs> Praise God. Um, and then on, let's see, in July at 530, the porch in Daytona, um, and we are going to have Dr. J. How many have been blessed to be in one of Dr. J's services? Woo! Shout out. Woo! Yeah. So that's going to be coming. Um, he's going to be here on July 16th. Okay. Um, so what are we doing June 25th? Anybody know? At 5.30. And then what special guests do we have? All right. And then on July 16th, who are we going to have? Oh, oh, my gosh. Are you? Oh, that's not nice. Are you? Are you? Everybody should have been saying, we have Dr. J. You got it right up there. Praise God. So let's worship. Well, good morning. I can tell everybody's got to wake up here today. Come on now, church. We just got done singing, He's Worthy of It All. And then we just like, oh, come on. Praise the Lord. Happy Father's Day. We're excited about what God has got in store today. I'm excited about this in this next few moments of our time together. But uh, as we get ready to move forward, we just want to uh, give you an opportunity at this time to receive our Sunday morning tithe and offering, our time of giving before the Lord. We thank the Lord for his faithfulness to our lives and the different ways that you can give, as you're well aware of. Uh, there's envelopes in the front seat. See, I have an envelope myself. I use, I, I still write checks occasionally, once in a while, just to keep my penmanship. No, doesn't do that either. But, uh, uh, but uh, and uh, the, uh, you can give cash or check, or you can give by credit, or you can give, we would prefer you like to give cash, I mean, in the sense of, Make sure you pay your credit cards off. Come on, don't go into debt. But the miriveroflife.org, or there's a QR code there as you give. We thank you for your faithfulness. Also, remembering missions, uh, because uh, our missionaries out there in the field need to be continuing to do 
be supported. God, in your investing in the future of the kingdom of God, every time you give, those things that God sends to those people who send across the world. Amen. Father, I thank you today for your gift, for the gift of you. I thank you, Father, that you're, I just thank you, Lord, I get to call you Father. No other belief system in the world calls their God Dad. No one else has the privilege of coming to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Master Creator, Ruler of all the universe, and call you Father, but you, but you. I know you, Lord, as Master. I know you as Creator. I know you as the all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere God, the unlimited Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, the first and the last. He who rises high, whose enemies tremble in his presence, whose subjects fall on their face in loving adoration and worship. But I also know you as dead. The one that I can come to and spend time with. There's always that moment that you let me know that you see me individually. I don't stand in a crowd unnoticed by my father. I don't stand in the masses of a sea of humanity unknown to you. Lord, you can pick me out of the multitude and you make me special. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord God, for the blessing of you in my life. And it's my honor and privilege to partner together with you in the kingdom you have built for all of us in saying yes to you, who gives me life, strength, and ability to overcome. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. What a special day. Father's a special person that no matter how tall you grow, you always look up to him. Fathers have a great impact upon our lives. We're going to do something unique today. Um, I felt this upon my heart. I've kept it a secret. My wife doesn't even know what I'm going to do. Here we go. Aha. Uh -huh. And we're going to do something special today because there's, there are stories in this room, tons of stories this room, but I want to just uh, open up on, this, on the premise of this. We talk a lot about Father Abraham, which we rightly should. He's a role model and example, but we've spent little time talking, we spend little time talking about Isaac and Jacob in reference to their encounters with God, and I want to start off today because I want to give an opportunity for a, 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 another brother by another mother who shares the same father as we do. Come on. And I want you to give a warm greeting today as Brother Mark Simcox comes and joins me, and we're going to share this time together before you this morning. Amen. Come on. Come on, Brother Mark. have a story and if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior then you've connected with his father who now becomes your father and today we want to pay tribute with our lives together with you and to the loving kindness of our Heavenly Father go ahead brother Mark uh, thank you thank Pat for the opportunity uh, believe it or not, it's really humbling to be up here. You know, uh, you know, spirits all over me. But you know, talking about Father's Day, and I'm here celebrating my Heavenly Father. My earthly father wasn't 
too much of it, right? Don't come to a huge establishment. not good when you turn around. I mean, some of us have good parents, and praise God for that. But not all of us are, get that opportunity. We don't get a chance sometimes to choose our mom and dad when we come into this world. You know, King David said this. He said, when I was stuck in the mud, God pulled me up out of the mud. And you know, my earthly parents, they were they were alcoholics, and they, uh, my dad drank, you know, there was uh, four of us in the family, I had a, and it seemed, we uh, grew up in New Jersey, and as we grew up in New Jersey, we was living, they called us the Pine Barrens when we did that. I want to then four, well, getting on to four categories that I'm going to one of them's family, another one's marriage, another one's time, and the other one's prison time. Some of you guys know me, some of you guys don't. But like I said, my family wasn't good. They were always drunk. And, and, and my older sister, they always turned around and said, well, you watch the kids and stuff like that. And we lived out in the middle of a place called the Pine Barrens. The Pineys, they used to call them rednecks. They knew what I mean. There ain't no but, uh, you know, and God always tells me, he says, he used to, if you read the word, like uh, I brought the Bible with me, I won't open it because God's laid a lot of things on my heart. We don't have enough time, uh, unless you'd like the Apostle Paul preach all night. But, you know, my family, uh, they was always drinking, they was always doing something, but it was my sister Kat. They said, you watch the kids. I, we got to go here. We got to go to this bar. And there was abuse in the family. And I remember when I was five years old that I was at my grandmother's and I see my grandmother hit me in the phone. <laughs> and she said, your sister's dead. They found her hanging in the barn where she committed suicide because she couldn't handle it no more. And, you know, and after that, it was kind of like a little wake-up call. And you know, it's funny how God has a, a purpose, even if it doesn't matter where you come from or what you did, but God still loves you right where you're at. And one of the first encounters I've had with the Lord, uh, I was five years old, but I remember that we was down on a cranberry bog and it was ice during the winter and my father had killed a deer and it was on the other side. They had a bonfire where they was dressing the deer up, and then they had a bonfire on this there. They wouldn't get long. And I and I was my sister Kat. I said, "You better watch." And while I was on the ice, running around the, uh, the ice on my tricycle, and that boat tied on it to like no chain. And I turned around and seen this light, and I said, "Fire!" Get that light. I said, "I'll find my father." Well. She turned her back and I was gone. You know anything about a bonfire. Once you get out, you can't stay. And she started yelling. And my front wheel actually fell in the ice. And I started screaming. And I remember to this day, my dad said, don't let go of those handlebars. And my brother laid on his stomach or my dad laid on his stomach and they pulled him down. That was my first encounter. I believe that there was an angel or something protecting me because I'd have been gone. But you know, as time went on, we moved out and stuff like that. I lost my sister and my father. He was uh, 44 years old. He had a massive heart attack in 1969. And I was kind of, the abuse in the family, but I didn't recognize them. You know, but I was 12, 13, passed away, and it kind of took the air out of my balloon, you know, and all this time it went on, and, and nobody, right then, it, it seemed like nobody could do nothing with me. They could have sat down and talked to me, you know, 
And that's when I'm in the prison. I preach on my thumb. I say, we know you, Jesus. And that's how come we have this problem that we have. Because people need to talk to when they lose their father or mother or a loved, a loved one in the family. But, you know, time went on and then I didn't know that many, many years down the road that I'd be in the ministry. And God is God and I'm not. But you know, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my family because after that I got into drugs. I turned around and I didn't want to be at home. I didn't want to listen to my mom. But believe it or not, after my father had passed away, my mom turned around and found another man. Jesus Christ. And because of her today, I'm standing here telling you about my family and the things that go on. She devoted her life to pray for her pastor. And she prayed and prayed and prayed. And you know, she all oh, she uh, yeah, I still remember the heel marks that when she was dragging me to church. You know? And you know, she always called me a pot liquor. But, you know, she, because of my way and because of what happened in my life, and nobody really talked to me, it's always, you're, you're, and I started doing drugs, and next thing I know, it's, you're a drug addict, you're a thief, you know, and, and one time, you know, it's pretty bad when your family calls you a drug addict, a thief, that you're no good, you'll never amount to anything. I said, Mom, I know all that, that's why I just started agreeing. I started agreeing with her, you know. This went on just about two years. I ended up in prison. I've done about 15 years. I found a crime lord. I shot heroin and cocaine for 15 years. OD two or three times. You know, but God's hand was still on my life because he's seen a purpose and a reason why that I can live. You know, I, and God's sovereign. Like I said, he's God and I'm not. But, you know, time went on and he just dealt in my life and dealt in my life. I still went to a church where mom drove me occasionally here and there, but still God was still doing his work in me, preparing me, you know, and, and then I got married, you know, and as I got married, you know, it was like, as a matter of fact, I'm going to talk about marriage. I've been married four times, but that's the next thing. Yeah, until I get done. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, God loves me. I know this. I know in my heart that there's nothing too hard for him. He loves you right where you're at. He don't care what you did or who you did it to, but he loves you. And you got to realize this. And if you turn around and seek him with a whole heart, you will find him. Seek his face. A lot of people, they turn around and seek his hand. If you seek his face, you'll get his hand. Because it says in the word, if you first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he'll supply all your needs. Not all your wants, but all your needs. And as you turn around and, and, and get to learn God and spend time with him in fellowship, God will turn around and bring you into things. And Pastor always said this, it's not about, I always wanted God to come down and line up with me. But it wasn't about God lining up. I had to line up with him. When you line up with him, Satan's going to line you turn around, you, you'll find yourself in his will. And when you turn around, he hears your prayers. You might not always get them answered the way you want, but he'll turn around and answer them. Yes, no, and say no. You know, but time went on like that. And uh, my my uh, father died in 69, then my, brother, uh, my mother died in 1996. And I always thought that my mom hated me because she was saying all this and condemned me. See, and I'm going to tell you right now, you might have parents, you might have friends out there that say this or say that, but it doesn't matter. You know, God loves you. He says to the father, he will become a father. To the mother, he will become a mother. It depends on how you seek him and how much you seek him.
get things done in your life. Because he, he loves it. He wants to change it. And I'm telling you, if he changed me, he'll change you. You know, I'm the, he's no respecter of person. You go ask him, you will find out. But, you know, after my uh, mother passed away, it seemed like uh, time, well, time just went on. But, but you know, gradually, They already prayed in my hometown church that, that I'd become a preacher and stuff like that, and I just blew it, in, blew, it in the, blew it in the wind. You know, I remember one time I was up in uh, New Jersey at Assembly of God Church, a little church. Uh, I don't know, a few members in it, but uh, Steve Carroll was there with David Wilkins, and they was all up front, and they turned around, and if we had a year, more or less. And they, see, they fit, uh, see, I'm a byway to the highway. Many parts of the body of Christ, but it depends on how you react to it. Me, I'm a byway to the highway. Like I was downtown Choco one time, right down off of T Street, and I remember God turning around and telling me, "Remember you used to come down here and get crack cocaine?" I said, "Yes, Lord, I remember." And I was down here talking to a friend of a friend, you know. But anyhow, God says, "Never forget where you come from. Use that as a stepping stone to go forward." You know, it's just like George. There was a guy over there talking on the phone. He told me, he was doing like this. He'd hang up the phone. He'd turn around. He'd pick the phone up. He's yelling. He's hanging up. I'm sitting there looking at him. I said, there ain't nobody on that phone. I said, wonder who's talking to him. See, his name was George. He used to sit on Todd's Road. Nobody, like Pastor said, see, they all called him a bum. I remember I stopped to give him an umbrella. I gave him an umbrella to use one time. And I asked him, But, you know, I didn't know George's story. I didn't know that he lost his whole family in a fire, and he thought that he deserved that. Nobody knows the story. And, you know, some people judge us for different things because they don't know where we come from. The Father does. Heavenly Father, he knows exactly. He knows exactly what makes us tick. But, you know, Then I remember when I got out, I was doing 30 days of child support. And then just like Ralph did, the light bulb was on the wall. I quit smoking. I quit drugs. And I'm telling you right now, I took that language out of my mouth. It changed. I don't know why people have to have a conversation with nasty words. I bigger, it makes you look like an idiot. <laughs> but, but you know, but, and I ran to a church. I was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I read my Bible every day. And God was slowly, still, still pulling me out of the mud. And he was still, you ever step in the mud with boots and you can't, it's just a suck and it's so great. But he kept pulling me out of the mud and he kept changing Little by little, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I when, he, when I turned around and, and, and started uh, uh, going to church, I started going to church, things started happening. I remember to a time, it was a year after I got saved, God came to me. He said, I want to go, I want you to go get me drunk. So I was like, I said, Lord. I got letters home showing the state of New Jersey, the state of Florida, and out west. They had taken my wife and took her. And I, I, I actually was in my prayer room. I walked outside and I said, Lord, you were flat crazy. They will never, never give me my license back. And the Spirit spoke to me and said, what, what's impossible by man, but all things are possible by me. Do you 
understand. If you try, I said, Lord, resist. I said, oh, I have 15 DUIs. I have 32 counts of driving while suspended. I mean, they, my life is gone. <laughs> but, you know, I said, Lord, if you give them back, I said, I will use them for your ministry. It took me a year to go back to school, DUI school. I said, because I figured, see, you got to realize there were 12 disciples on that boat. Only one of them got up and said, Lord, if this is you, I will turn around and come to you. Forbid me to come unto you. And Peter's the only one. If Peter turned around, if they'd have stayed in the boat, first of all, Peter would have been killed. He had an opportunity. He took, he didn't kill a fault. months later, I got a letter <laughs> that said, you're eligible for your driver's license. You know, and a year later, I turned around, I, you know, and I noticed when God tells you to do something, you don't need the alphabet. <laughs> when he, am I all right here? Okay. Uh, and, and he, I said, remember that I went went through the school, DUI school, did all that, and the woman goes, have you ever had a driver's license? I said, no, which I lied. You know, I felt the spirit lie, but because I did that, it cost me an extra 30 days to get my license back. <laughs> so I had to go to a new driver's school, so I went back, and I turned around, and I said, Pastor Rick, I said, uh, I said, you know, it went by, and uh, and uh, anyhow, I went back for thirty days, and it said there, and the woman said, "Did you fill out the dirt?" And I said, "Yeah." She said, "Said, have you ever had a driver's license?" I said, "Say yes." I said, "No." I lied again. I felt the spirit. Don't lie. I said. She said, "Are you sure?" I said, "Yes, yes. I had one." She said, in that case, then, you don't have to take the driver's test. I went over and took my ticket. But you ever went? And I'll tell you, the last 20, 25 years since that time, the license has been in my pocket. I've had one ticket. And I'll tell you right now, they've taken me back to the prison ministry. They've taken me to death row. They've taken, I've been serving the Lord with them. You know, because he felt that I was, see, he's seen that I had a purpose. And he's seen something that I didn't see. And I had to trust him and step out of the boat and do what I was going to do. And you know, and that, and God slowly is pulling me out of the mud pit and giving me things. But you know, when you're a habitual back. God will take you to the woodshed. And I'll tell you right now, sometimes when you go to climb that ladder, he'll put you on a test and you have to climb that ladder and see if you're worthy of it. You don't climb, you don't mock God. You don't turn around and use dirt and say, God, God will test you in these areas. But see, even that, he knew where my heart was. You know, I used to hang out with the Vegas motorcycle gang. I'm telling you right now. And then, like I said, I remember 22 years ago, a lot of you guys know me 20 years ago, that me and my wife, we lost Heather Child as far as marriage was concerned. 22 years ago. And I'll tell you, I've been married four times. You know, you might not believe it, but I was a woman beater. I'd, I'd beat a woman just as quick as I'd beat a man. I love to fight. I love to drink. But I'm telling you, but I'm telling you right now, that woman over there, I've never, never laid a hand on her. Never. Why? Because 
God has gave me a new heart. He changed me. See? And I'll tell you right now, people don't understand when you get married, when God says you're no longer two, you're one. They don't understand what the one part is. One, when God takes you to be the same way. I'll tell you right now, for seven years, seven years, I had a jealousy problem, spirit of it. And I'm telling you, some of you people out there, or by the airways or whatever, you might be turning around and have a problem. And I'm telling you, but if you go after God, you turn around. Yeah, it's pretty bad when you come to church and you're praising God, praise God. All day long, you turn around and make plans for Satan. And you turn around and argue all the way home. Because of some jealousy. But I'll tell you, for seven years, I fought. I even got to a point that I turned back and said, Lord, I cannot handle this. See, you got to come to a breaking point. I said, I'd rather be in your presence. And then let her be happy and let everything go on. And that's when it broke. I remember Pastor Becky stood right up. She goes, today, today, somebody is starting to believe what the Lord is telling them. Satan fabricated. He, his false evidence appears real. He will make things look real and they will look real but until you start believing this word believing what God puts upon your heart for seven years I went through that and then God again started being told me out of that bush well guess what? It's been 15 years 15 years since we turned around and I'll tell you she's my friend Nothing that goes through our household that we don't sit down at the table and talk about. She knows what I'm going to say. Before I think I told her, I was going to tell her on this one. But I'm telling you right now, see, when God starts, and you know, and I'm telling you, if there's some Christian men out there, they don't understand what it is to love your wife. As Christ loves the church, we're supposed to love our wife. And vice versa, you're supposed to be submissive to women too. Submissive to your husband in a godly manner. But see, sometimes, you know, when you belittle your wife or anybody, you know, this is a message for somebody. If you belittle your wife or try to hurt them in your mouth, that's just like Jesus. You know that? It's just like Jesus. He's supposed to love on them. And I'm telling you, you know, very few words that we have. At times she says, I love you, but I don't like what you say. You know? And that and there's sometimes we have disagreements, but it's far and few. Why? Because it, again, God turned around and started pulling me out of the mud, you know. And you know, when he does this, you gotta be submissive, you gotta hear him. Am I still all right, Pastor? Gotta, you gotta love your wife. You gotta, you gotta help her. You know, and as you get older, you gotta really help both of each other. You know, <laughs> these bodies get old. You know, I mean, you know, uh, we live out in the middle of Cocoa, out in the middle of nowhere. But uh, you know, but you know, but God has blessed me. My Father, my Heavenly. See, he, he just loves on me in a very, very special way. He'll love on anybody. But if you let him follow you, follow the word. The word is the plan of us to our feet. You know, and when it comes to, like, money, you know, we're a little constrained right now. I'm going to hurry up. I'm going to get quick. But when it comes to time, best man, you know, but, you know, you, you, 
but you got to obey the word of God and do what he says. He ain't going to turn around and get you on the desert and get back to you today. He won't do that. You know? But you know, the last thing is, it says it's like a tree. You know, it's how I got into prison ministry. I'm going to tell you a story how I got into prison ministry. And I always thought I was I believe that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You're, we're more than a conqueror. He's got a respect for his word for us. He loves you. And, and you know, prison ministry, I figure I always had a call and a spot in my heart in prison ministry. And I remember when I went to the county jail, I said, Lord, I'm going to be sharp. I've been there done time. I called him back, Bobby. And I said, what are you telling him? He said, you called me back, I'll deal with it. So I called him back. And he said, Mark, I hate to tell you, but the administrator don't accept you. You're not fit the category to come into prison. I said, what are you talking about? And I said, I've been there. I said, I've been there. I said, I know. I said, I, I said, I fit the category perfect. I said, he said, I want you to come in, but the administration, I guess, was like, I've done time and this and that and the other, you know. And I said, all right. And I was so just feeling tried so hard. And I said, God, you want me to do something? He pushed me. He tried everything. And it just falls out on the ground. Well, I went. I said, well, at least let me get my paperwork. I went and got my paperwork. And I go home. I go to the Lord. He's still home in the Wilson Center about my life. I went into the bedroom, I dropped on the floor, and I said, Lord, I believe that you called me to ministry. I said, Lord, I can't do this. I said, if you want me in, you're going to have to do it. One day, one day we was on our way to Walmart and had a beer, come off a rip. Anyhow, I thought I'd seen a wallet. Well, it's good at McDonald's. I'm hungry. So we went to McDonald's. We're in there eating. And I always wear a Christian hat on or a Christian T-shirt. If you ask my wife, there's not one place. I don't care if it's Walmart, any place. If I'm always walking to Walmart. Well, God bless you. Have a good day. You know? Or, or yeah, that's all you have to say to somebody. Walking down the aisle. I do it all the time. You know? to be honest with them, but yet some of us in church, we just don't do anything. I mean, this is me I'm talking about. I don't know what God's called you. But anyhow, we went in there and I was standing alongside of the guy and he said, you know, had a t-shirt he had on. I said, are you a Christian? He said, I'm really doing it for money. You know? I said, <laughs> I said, are you a Christian? I said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? He looked at me and he said, we're all I said, so, you're saying you are a Christian and you do believe in Jesus Christ. He said, like I said, we're all children of God. When he said a few words in his mind, they had a different, there was something about it. I mean, they, I could feel the penetration of the spirit in him. And I went and got my food and I sat here and my wife sat there and he sat down. And he keeps me thinking like this. Good in Mass? I said, Mass is my favorite subject. He started reading my email and telling me something about my wife. And I'd never seen this man before, and I haven't seen him since. He talked to me and said, Yeah, I know you. But anyhow, I sit there, I said, Yeah, Mass was my favorite subject. And he turned around and said, Yeah. And he 
said to him, Can you preach? And I said, I don't want to go out. I can preach in my church. The men preach. I'll take him out. I said, Yeah, I said, Me and my wife, I said, We tried to get him to bring us in, and we had to, but they turned us down, you know. And he said, So Pastor said, Can you come? I said, Yeah, I know that. I said, Can you come and just preach for me? With that, he just finished his food. burnt me so bad when I got home. I called Pastor. I said, Pastor, I said, I believe I just ran to a messenger from God and gave this message. It was like 30 days or to the day. And I said to him, I said, something bubbled up in my spirit. And I'll tell you right now, it'll be 60 days and I believe to the day. Well, we got stopped and went to Publix. swinging at us. Are you swinging a Bible? He said, no, but I got one. I said, you're a Christian. Are you preaching the name of Christ? He said, yeah. So he turned around and he said to us, he said, I'm in the prison ministry. If you'd like to join me, two weeks later, I was preaching at Penn PCI. And that's been 20, what, two years ago? She is, it had an impact on her so much that she even put it down in the conference. I believe I hope this message that I gave today, I'm sorry, Pastor, I didn't mean to do that. But I believe that we all need to seek God with all of our heart, don't we? I believe that you go after him and he will give you whatever you want, whatever you need. And I believe that he loves you right where you're at. I don't care what you do. There's no, there's, there's nothing you have to submit to that evil. Think you're in a mud pit? Don't worry, he knows how to pull you out. And I'm telling you, he's a good God and he loves you. Thank you very much, sir. Stay, stay right there, there, there. You know, we could have sat down today. I could have, I could have performed some theatrical great message and called, called down fire from heaven and walked through streets of gold. But we live real lives. We live real lives. In your drawer, I heard you say, in your drawer at home, you've got the letters that said, you'll never serve in prison ministry and you'll never have a driver's license. Right. But you know, when it's amazing when you have a father That's right. who sees in secret, who has pull. I say, who has pull and has other plans, what your father can do if you're willing to work with your father. And by the way, you're paid for home. It's not a dumpster. It's not a Salvation Army clothing bed, no, is it? No. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm looking at Marley back there going, no. What I'm trying to, what, what I want you to see, what we need to see is no matter where our path or our originations come from, or no matter what takes place in our journey, our Father always has a better outcome for us in store. Amen. I don't know a true mom or true dad anywhere that wants less for their kids than they've had for themselves. If anything, they want more for you. That's one of the reasons why we've seen so many spoiled kids that haven't learned how to appreciate what they've got because they wanted you to have what they've never had because they want you to have more. They want you to be more. Our Heavenly Father, Jesus died to give us a life that's better than any life we could ever have on our own or with anybody else. He died to give us the life that the Father designed for us to have. And I just want to encourage you this morning 
here in the next few moments that regardless of where you are right now, you need to realize you have a father. I was paying a close attention. I've been reading through, I was just reading through the gospels in the last couple of days. Everywhere Jesus spoke of Father God, man, he spoke of him by Father many, many, many times. And he always distinguished when he spoke on the term Father. Father in the Bible has got a little F unless you're talking about, lowercase F, unless you're talking about Father God, then it's a cap. It's always capped. And he always says, your Father in heaven. He wanted to distinguish the fact that when I'm talking about a father, I can talk about your earthly father and I can talk about your heavenly father. But when he talked about the heavenly father, he began to speak about the richness of life, what is available in him, what he, and how he cares and how he watches over us and the plans that he has for our life. You're not limited by your earthly dynamic. I was standing the other day with a young man named, an evangelist named Adam, a very powerful young man, and we were, we were praying in the moment and they were dealing with some things in a, uh, that, were, that had to do with family generational curses with cancers running through bloodlines. And all of a sudden, this, this father spoke to me, the Spirit of God spoke to me, and he said, listen, you aren't the son of Adam number one. You're the son of the second Adam. Yeah. Jesus is the second Adam. When I step into my relationship with Jesus, now I, become, I come directly to my father God. In the Old Testament, before he started becoming father, he was always creator God. When Jesus came, he moved from that position of being creator and, and to father because of the intimacy he always wanted to have with us. On the side of the mountain there, in, 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 when Moses went up and took the children of Israel, God gave, them, God gave them the Ten Commandments. Before then, God came down on the mountain to speak to the people. When he came, the ground shook. It shook every time he was, he was present on the mountain. But when he spoke, his voice thundered. And when it thundered, it scared them. Sometimes dads carry a bearing when they walk in the room. There's something about your dad. You know, when you walk in, it's interesting with kids because mom's got that nurture, that tenderness, that gentleness, that kindness, that, that, that part where the kids just feel like they're enraptured in this soft, cuddly, quiet, beautiful, euphoric environment. Dad comes in the room and there's this, and the, when the child moves from mom to dad, the, the child has to change its posture because it's not, it's, not, it's not in a fluffy down pillow, even if you might be a little bit fluffier than others. Come on. The child all of a sudden set, nestles into the strength that they feel in the father's arms. The, the bearing that's there. There's a confidence and a security that they feel that's different than their mom. It's not rigid in something that repels them. It's rigid in the sense that it's something I can hold on to that won't turn loose of me. It's something that will be there. It's like a rock that won't move when everything else around me is moving. That sense that's there. Our Father, our Heavenly Father comes to embrace us out of His goodness and His kindness. He will take us, like He said, He's not looking to give us a handout. He's looking to give us a hand up. And for the last 20 years, He's gone back into an environment He spent 15 years in and out of serving time for things He had done, trying to help guys that are in there not to, so that when they get out, they won't go back. He wanted to let them know that there is a Father in heaven that can change your stars and change the direction of your life. Restore your family. He'll restore your family. He's, you, got, you got your microphone, don't you? What'd you do with it? You put it down? You thought I wasn't going to let you talk at all, didn't you? <laughs> what, you, know, you're, you had kids from your previous marriages. After my wife was just talking about uh, I hadn't seen my daughter, oh, I've always prayed for them and about four years ago, I got a letter saying that my daughter wanted to see me. And she's four years back into my life. And we go out to dinner all the time. They got to come down on occasions. They got a house in Daytona. And I have a son that was a, a drug addict. And just this past week, I haven't talked to him in 15, 20 years. And he, I got to talk to him the other day. He said, Dad, I can't handle it no more. He says, I need to change. I said, it's going to take time. But all my, every minute, my sister that hated me, 
that she, if I was standing on a cliff, she'd be the first one to push me off. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you right now, the house she's living in, me and my wife sold her. We moved them down here. Moved my big brother down here. My younger brother, he's down here. He quit drinking. See, God is a reconciliation. With the canker worm and the locust I've eaten up, he will give you double for you. Praise the Lord. Go, give, give the Lord a hand again for just a minute. I was a 13-year-old boy sitting on a driveway after 27 years of marriage and seven kids, and my mom and dad had a divorce. And walked away. Alcoholism and all the things that were in, their, it was in our life. I was raised in an alcoholic environment, an environment that was abusive. But I'll tell you, I could sit there and spend the time about the things that were negative about my relationship with my dad. But today I live not with the negatives, I live with the positives. The little glimpses and the little windows, those few moments. And one of the things I was reminded of this morning was the nuances that you have. Sometimes there's a sibling rivalry in any kind of a family dynamic if there's more than one child because they look for favorites and how parents treat us differently. But parents also see different things in us too. It's that moment when you can celebrate the, in the interesting nuance that you get with a parent that the other ones don't have, that you missed all the while you were growing up because you were competing for their for the same affection. When in reality, you weren't embracing the affection you were the affection you were getting. Sometimes there's an affection that you get that the other ones don't get that is special, but you want what they have. And for some odd reason, because you didn't get that, you feel like what you got wasn't worthy or wasn't worth it. But but if you go back and let the Father God show you something, you might find some things that were interesting that you had. And if you sit down and talk with one of your siblings many, many years later, you might find that they were jealous over the affection you got. That they saw something that you were getting that they didn't get, and they wanted that. And when you wanted what they had, but they, were, but they got what they had all the time, so they didn't think it was that big of a deal because they weren't getting what you got. And what I mean by that is when I was praying a little bit earlier was this, is that Father God sees me in a crowd. I can, look, I can look in a crowd, it don't take me very long. If I'm looking for my kids, I can find them. A mother can hear, can be sitting in, in, in a room, and all these children can be in another place. But, if, but when your child cries out, you hear your, excuse me, you hear your child's voice in the midst of all the other children. A father knows, I'll never forget when I stepped out. I remember my son graduated from boot camp. And I walked in. I remember the boy that I saw when I said goodbye to him at the induction center over in Tampa. And then I, re I remembered 12 weeks later, standing and watching him stand in line. He was, he was the guide in his, in his flight group. And so I, I watched that morning come around doing cadence, carrying the flag, calling cadence around as they were running around that place, watching my son there. I was, I was proud of myself. I was, I was that dad, man. Good. And I wasn't, my buttons weren't busting because my shirt was too tight. You know what I'm saying? It was because of pride. You're watching them when they come to parade rest at the end of the ceremony, and they get you get to go over and you get to tap your son out. When you tap him out, you know, they're standing there at parade rest, and you get to walk up to him. And when I walked up to him standing there with his flight group at, at, at that moment, when I looked him in the eyes, I, 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 I about melted because what I looked at was not the same person I said goodbye to when I saw him at the induction center. Watching the growth that happened in my son's life. My father in heaven has been watching my growth all the while. He's watched over me even when others have failed me. He has always been faithful to me, steadfast to me. He has grown me up. He's watched me. I don't have time this morning to go into all the scriptures, but I just want to take you to two or three things real fast in about two or three minutes. Isaac had his own encounters with God. Isaac had an encounter with God because Abraham took him and put him on an altar. Isaac let him do that. I don't know how obedient you have ever been to your parents putting you on an altar. He let him. He watched how God delivered him and providentially provided a ram. But after that, he, he goes through life. He gets married. Things are happening. He buries his dad. It's not until after he buries his dad that he has an encounter with God. And God visits Isaac because he's no longer just the God of, he's not only the 
the God of Abraham. He's got to become the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you understand? It's amazing that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What makes him Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because all three of them had God encounters the same. God told all three of them the same thing. God carried his promises to Abraham. He even told Isaac, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to be with you because your father was with me and your father did this and your father did that. And because your father did these things, I'm going to do this with you no matter what. He didn't even make his relationship conditional, but Abraham moved into a relationship that was built on condition. Abraham proved obedience, so God proved his God affirmed his obedience by saying, I'm going to be with your boys no matter what they do. And he, and, he, and he didn't say they had to have the faith of Abraham. When you look at the encounter, he says, I'm going to do this through your bloodline. He didn't even tell them they had to do anything other than the fact you're Abraham's son and I'm going to be your father. I'm going to be your God. Jacob had the same encounters themselves. There comes a moment in time when you and I can no longer serve the God of our fathers. He must be our father God too. He wants us to have encounters with him. Even Isaac gave God a tithe. There's a moment when Mark was talking about that fact of giving. You give God. There was a moment when God blessed Isaac and Isaac said, I'm gonna tithe that he tithed to God. We talk about Abraham's tithe. I'm not here to pull an offering from you. I'm here to tell you, when you have an encounter with God, your father, not just with God, with God, your father, there's a difference when you serve an innate God that's this powerful figure that controls and rules everything, and there's another one that will bow down his, and bow down and bend his ear to you, reach out and touch you, pull you into himself and cradle you and comfort you, not just look at you and tell you what you're worth. You have a father who came after you. You have a father who sent his son to come get you. You have the one who's willing to leave the 99 to get the one. You have the one who will never leave you nor forsake you, whose ear is always open to your cry, whose eye is not dim concerning you, whose always his hand is not short concerning your need. He is a father who will not withhold from you. He's the best dad there is. He's the best dad there is. Marie mentioned about orphans. We shouldn't be an orphan in the house. But sometimes we carry that orphan mentality. I don't belong because I'm not connected. I don't belong because I don't feel seen. I want you to know in this place that you, that's my heart's desire. It's my heart's desire that you, are, you feel and sense that you are seen, that you are seen by fathers in this house and that you're seen by our Father God, that you're not invisible and you're not unimportant and you're not less than, but you are more than enough, that you are seen as sons and daughters, not only of the most high, but sons and daughters of the house that there's a father mentality and a heart and a mothering heart in this house that you can stand and be all that you can be. I want you to understand something. You are more, you are more than you realize and you are a lot more than you've been told. And I want the good of God in you to be called out of you. We don't need to do, like Mark said, there comes a point in time when, when, when you're called all these things, you just decide to surrender and buy into it. And the devil loves it because he can ride that wave. There's no work for him to ride that wave. But we need to stir the water. And we need to throw the devil off the surfboard that he's been riding in our life for too many years. And we need to change the dynamics of the moment and step into the fact that your father's called the good out of you. And the good out of you is bigger and richer and fuller and greater than anything else that you've ever experienced in your life. And if anything, that which has been zapping the energy out of you is going to be restored to you because the good in you will energize you. It will fill you up. It will empower you. And it will strengthen you and give you strength and new life. And I speak life to you in the name of Jesus. And today, if your father, if your biological father, 
If you're not a biological father, it's okay because you can be and should be a spiritual dad. I got spiritual sons. I got sons that call me my kids and get jealous. I got, I got sons and daughters, and, and some of them call me dad. I got a son that calls me every week, sometimes two or three times a week. And we spoke, he calls me, he says, hey, dad, how you doing? I said, hey, son, sometimes my wife hears me. She says, are you talking to Chad? I said, no, I'm talking to one of my other sons. <laughs> said, you, better not let your son, you better not let Chad hear you say that. <laughs> because they're just as much a son to me. Do you hear me? And the legacies. And, man, and, and let me just say this real quick because I quit. The promises or the things of your future that God has spoken to you may be realized more in your children and your children's children than in you. But how you live will determine on how well they'll be able to embrace and quickly that which God has given you a promise to. Because Abraham did what he did, God made unconditional commitments to his kids. I said God made unconditional commitments to his kids because of how Abraham lived before God. Oh, that God would make a promise to me because of the way I lived before him that my kids couldn't shake because God made the promise to me on their behalf. That I could walk in such a way before my heavenly father that he would take such delight in me that he would make promises to me to the legacy of the generations after me that, that, that would take place whether they served him like I wanted them to or not. That's the kind of promise, the unconditional promise that a father will give a son, that I'll be faithful to your lineage even if they struggle with me. Jacob and Isaac lived before Father God, and God still gave them the things that are there. You don't hear a whole lot about the 12 sons of the tribes. Actually, when it comes time to the blessing of Jacob, he didn't have a lot of great things to say about all of them when he was blessing his kids. But you know what? They became the 12 tribes of the 12 nations of Israel. They're, they'll sit on thrones before God's kingdom. They're, they're, they're established in the heavenlies because God has made promises to Abraham that they have a place because a father paved the way. I want to encourage you. Mark chose today, and I'm living proof. I don't care where you are in your life. And what I mean I don't care is I'm just, I don't care in the sense if you think it's going to stop you, you got to forget that stuff. Because nothing, nothing can stop the Lord God Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Nothing. If we will find favor and pleasure in him. My brother-in-law lost his children and stuff of that nature. And God has begun restoring, after 20-something years, began restoring relationships with his children. I'm telling you, God gives you back your life and then some. That's what a father does to a son who's not looking for a handout but a hand up. Amen. Stand to your feet this morning. Jesus was getting ready, to, was, was talking to the disciples. He was telling them about his transition in John. John 14, 15, and 16, powerful times. Jesus was speaking so much about Father. But he made the time, he, he says, I'm going to be going and I'm going to be gone, and then you're going to go to the Father. You're going to go to the Father in my name. And Jesus prayed that to the Father in John 17 that we would be one with him and with Father God as Jesus is one with him. That we would know the intimacy of our heavenly Father. The embrace of him. That we would be in him and he would be in us. God speaks to us from heaven because from the beginning of time, God created a man and a woman and he walked in the midst of a garden and he spent time with them. God walked in the garden and God spoke to his creation, Adam. And even Eve was there. God wants relationship with you. I said, God wants relationship with you. Maybe even today you have a broken relationship with your parents. Maybe today you have a broken relationship with your family or with your children. As much as God wants relationship with you, 
most of the people that you have a broken relationship with want a relationship with you. They just don't know how to fix it or they don't know how to mend it. Someone's got to make the first move. I said, someone has got to make the first move. And I would encourage you today as you feel unctioned by Holy Spirit, that if you feel that a move needs to be made, maybe it would be you that would make the move. For all you know today, there's someone at home somewhere praying to hear from you and they haven't heard from you in a long time. And they're not necessarily needing a report that your life is all, the, all that in a bag of chips, but maybe just the fact that you're in a good place and you're doing well and God is with you. That moment that says, I see you, I care about you, you're important. I just wanna hear, what I tell my brothers many times when I call them, they go, what are you doing? I say, I just wanna hear my brother's voice. I just want to hear my brother's voice. So good to hear your voice. Does my heart good to hear you? Does my heart good to see you? Does my heart good to embrace you? Because we've got history together. Good or bad, it makes no difference. There's always something good that can come out of even the bad. I can proof of that. Mark's a proof of that. Your proof that good can even come out of bad things. Because God can take that which is meant to destroy and breathe life into it. Heal and restore and make it new. And I just speak to you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I speak healing. Lord God, I'm not speaking words of magic here right now in this moment. Lord, because I know for some of us it's a process. But Lord, I speak healing to the pain in the lives of those here today that have suffered. But Lord, I also speak a sober awakening to the hearts and minds of people within the ears of my voice that would be awakened unto the presence of you, the hope of you, the possibilities of you, and see the greatness that you have prepared for their future. And that which you bring is wholeness to their life. There's peace. Life isn't over. Life has just begun. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. And God's got great things in store for you because your father cares about you and yours and your future. Father, I release that now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for reconciliations where things are torn down. And Lord, instead of the memories that haunt me, now Lord, give me the memories that will bring fondness to my life. Those things that were good in my life, that I can dwell upon that which was good because I can build with good. And Father, I thank you for it now. In Jesus' mighty and precious name. We breathe and say, amen. Happy Father's Day.